At Snowplow, we often describe Snowplow in terms of what it isn't. Um, and that's something that we're actually really trying to move away from and um, give a more positive message about what Snowplow is. Um, and for the last few months, really, as a company, we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about what Snowplow is and how we believe Snowplow should be used. And there's um, a really interesting taxonomy that was sort of put, put forward by Satya Nadella from, from Microsoft. And he sort of speaks about these four types of system. So there's kind of your, your very well established and more old school system of records, so your ERPs, your CRMs, um, systems of intelligence, which, which kind of we know about quite a lot and you, you use to derive a lot of your insights, and systems of engagement. And there's kind of this new category that's emerged recently around systems of observation. And that's really where we see Snowplow. Um, and a lot of systems of intelligence, they have to bundle their systems of observation. So the data collection is bundled within them. And actually, what we're really striving to do is, is not to necessarily present those insights or be opinionated about what you should do with your data, but really be the best in class way of collecting your data to give you the flexibility to do what you want and pick your own tools to derive those insights on top of it. Um, and this is why we think we're a really good system of observation. So our data quality and structure is very, very high. And anybody that works with Snowplow data and has kind of maybe seen the range of different use cases and things you can achieve with it um, will we'll very much speak to this point. And also the richness of the data, so the sheer amount of fields that we track out of the box um, and the kind of enrichments that we do automatically and the enrichments that you can configure, can configure means that our data richness is really, really impressive. Um, and then it's all about actually owning and being in control of your own data collection. So the fact that our data pipelines run in your, in your own cloud environment, whether that's AWS or GCP, means that you actually do own your underlying data. And the flexibility um, and ability to define your own events and entities in a way that actually makes sense to your business. Um, and this kind of sets Cara's talk up quite nicely, but um, we've been thinking a lot about the developments that we've seen in the industry. And the, re the release of Redshift was actually like a huge inflection point and, and one of the reasons why Snowplow exists. Um, and I believe that actually Alex and Yali, the co-founders, were on the first private beta of Redshift. So we've been team Redshift from the, the very beginning. And we, we think that really brought about a massive change in the industry, but we believe that another change is coming. And it's all about the rise of the strategic data asset. And actually now when we speak to our customers, a lot of the value they see in having Snowplow, it isn't just about we got Snowplow to help us solve this use case. It's like we see the value of owning this strategic data asset and we're really, really excited about the things that we could achieve with it. Um, and it wouldn't be a snowplow meetup unless somebody put a diagram up of a snowplow pipeline. So I've just kind of shoehorned this in here. But again, like we're speaking around the ownership, the accuracy, the richness and the, the real time nature of snowplow. So um, if you're not actually a snowplow user, maybe this is, this is news to you. But, and this is just a conceptual overview of what we do but really our architecture talks to how we get to those kind of USPs. And then finally, like, so some of you are open source users, some of you are, are paying Snowplow users. Um, there's often quite a little bit of confusion around, around what that means and what, what the benefits are. But um, like when you're a Snowplow Insights customer, we manage your pipeline, we upgrade your infrastructure that's kind of no small task for, it, for a data team to undertake. And we really believe that people in data teams probably have more interesting things to do than, than pipeline upgrades and can probably add more value to the business by actually getting on with interesting data engineering tasks. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot of expertise in running Snowplow pipelines. Um, and we're, we're constantly evolving and, and building out our UI, where um, very soon customers will be able to test um, and then deploy their, their own custom events and entities. Um, and we're really trying to make a tool where it's a lot easier for people to actually manage their Snowplow pipelines. And anybody who is actually a, a Snowplow customer at the moment um, probably knows how awesome our support engineering team are who work 24-7 to try and help our customers. So that was just a little bit of an uh, overview um, of Snowplow. 
and I'm now going to hand over to Cara for a talk much more interesting than mine. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, as Rebecca said, I'm Cara. Um, I lead implementation engineering at Snowplow, uh, and so my main focus is on helping all of our customers um, get the most out of uh, their Snowplow pipeline and really get them set up, whether it's on the tracking side, the data modeling side, um, everything around the pipeline, really. So today I will be talking a bit about uh, the value of event data. As anyone knows who is a Snowplow customer or user, or really lots of other people in the industry, um, event data is data that captures each action a user or a service or so machine performs at a given time with the corresponding state at that time. And so really, um, originally kind of a lot of the, the analytics was around kind of aggregates. Um, whereas now a lot more is moving towards actual underlying event streams. So understanding at any given moment what's happening, what is each individual user doing. And so kind of the classic event uh, that you think of in the analytics world is the, the page view. Go to website, view a page. But really there's lots and lots of different types of events. Um, so you could have someone opening an email, you could have someone changing the channel on a smart TV, maybe checking your uh, bank balance in one of the new challenger banks, um, moving a position in a call center queue, logging into a mobile application like a server submitting some search results or um, failing to request something from, from a database. And so really like the, the industry has moved away from just thinking about kind of web analytics or mobile analytics, but actually thinking of, of event analytics and thinking about all the different actions that happen when users interact with your product or service in all the different places that they do that. Um, and so really when you, when you take a look at event-based analytics, at the bottom, um, very similar to the pipeline diagram um, that uh, Rebecca showed, you have uh, the data collection. So the, the, the collection of all the different sources, um, whether it's your servers, your mobile applications, any IoT devices, um, and you can use something like Snowplow, but there's also other tools in the market to just get that event level data. The next big step is storing that data in a data warehouse. And so there, the main already big differentiator of using like event level data rather than um, kind of um, doing everything report based is that you have that data that you can join with other data sources and model it according to your business model and um, your use case. And so you're not kind of going along the one size fits all of some of the other tools where you have like this is um, this is like we're all going to assume you're an e-commerce business or we're all going to assume your, your business model works like this. But really um, you can think about what, what makes sense to, to what levels of aggregation and what what user journeys make sense for your business. And then the last thing is, is the reporting side, where again, um, moving, so here really having this built from the ground up, where you have the, the kind of questions that you want to answer to the data dictate, what you collect, that being stored, and then that being visualized and analyzed um, in, that, in that fashion, rather than having those reports themselves dictate what you want to do and pushing the structure down. Um, and so it's really kind of analytics from the ground up, rather than analytics um, from the tool down. And so just to kind of clarify this, th this is maybe slightly abstract, we'll have a couple, a look at a couple of examples. Um, and, and before we do that, I think it's, it's quite interesting to highlight some of the maybe differences that this kind of from the ground up approach has um, to some of the more uh, traditional approaches. So a lot of tools, whether they are a, a reporting tool or a marketing automation tool or some other tool that helps you um, act on data, they normally, as Rebecca already mentioned in her uh, short introduction, um, data collection is more a means to an end. And so they only collect and process the data that's relevant to their use case. And they normally structure that data in a way that is very, very specific to their UI um, and to their backend. And of course, also as, as already mentioned, um, they have a certain set of assumptions um, to how to model that data. And that's just for the sheer ability to have everyone's data flow through the same process. Um, and so when you kind of collect your own data, then you can have that process suit your business model versus when, e when everyone's data is collected through the same kind of architecture, following the same business rules, big assumptions have to be made. And so a lot of times when you get one of these tools, you might get a tool that will work for one thing. So you might get a marketing automation tool and it will do brilliantly at, at forwarding data maybe to Google AdWords or to Facebook. But then when you want to give that data to your data scientist to understand your product a little bit better, then that can be really difficult because the data structure doesn't really suit that at all. 
And then last but not least, um, the, and something that's becoming increasingly more, more important is that a lot of these tools um, own your data. And so we really believe that it's important to own your data, not just so you can model it um, and, and use it in the way that you see fit, but also because it's something very valuable that you are otherwise giving away for free. <laughs> Can't seem to remember that. I need to push over there. Um, and so we'll just have a, a look at a couple of examples. The first one will be um, understanding user behavior on as the example, a property aggregator, but this would similarly apply also to a travel aggregator or another type of aggregator. And then another example we'll be looking at is on-site search results. So the first, um, uh, imagine a property aggregator. So a website that displays lots and lots of retail properties um, and um, they're kind of displayed there and for each one you can inquire um, whether or not um, this property is still for sale, maybe when the next viewing is, um, if you're interested. And so if you look at aggregated data, maybe an analyst is tasked with understanding why there's an ins like a very, very, very large number of views of all of these properties, but there seems to be a very small, small number of inquiries. And so that's just something where maybe an analyst is tasked with being like, okay, how can we see if we can increase this conversion rate? Can we understand what's going on here? And so actually, if you look at the aggregated data, that's very hard to do because you know how many people saw something and then you know how many people clicked on it. But you can't really see if there's different patterns in behavior between different types of users. If you have the underlying data, something that you might notice that there's actually two types of users on this site. And so the first is people to, who are actually looking to buy a house. And so they look at houses very intensely for a few months. They come every day and um, they're always applying the similar filters of you want a similar location, you want a similar um, size because that's what you're looking for because you actually want to buy something. And then there's actually a large number of people who look at houses irregularly over long periods of time. They don't really apply any filters or locations. Um, and so probably they're actually just, they just really enjoy looking at houses. It's kind of like watching telly. <laughs> and so by making that differentiation, instead of optimizing your site to, to kind of try and increase the overall conversion of these users, you can see that there's actually different personas here. And based on these personas, you don't want to optimize for the window shoppers. You want to optimize for the people who are actually going to buy a house and then maybe pay you a commission because they bought it through your platform. And so they're like being able to understand like how the individual users move through your site and maybe being able to infer some of their intent can be a really, really valuable um, asset in trying to improve your product and make your actual users uh, more happy customers. So the another example we're going to look at is on-site search optimization. And so this is just a, a very <laughs> rudimentary diagram of what it might look like if you look at the aggregations um, of the relationship of search results page views versus the clicks. And so in the big circle at the top on the left, you see all the people, they first come site, they perform a search, they see the search results page view. And then some of them will click on a result, some of them won't see anything that they like, and so they will search again moving into the next one. If again, they can't, if they find something, they'll click. If not, they will search again, maybe until they either find something or until they get bored and leave. And so again, if you say, okay, we want to we wanna optimize our search, like this doesn't look like a very good ratio of people finding what they need, and so probably we need to do something about it. And so maybe the initial assumption is that maybe our search, is, um, like our search algorithm isn't very good. It's not producing very relevant um, results. And so it's really interesting that like not many people seem to be finding what they're looking for. Um, and so it might be good to understand what's the difference between the people in bucket A and the people in bucket B. What are they doing differently? That means that those people are finding what they need um, and the people in B are not finding what they need. And so maybe some of the initial hypotheses that you might have is like maybe people A seem like just scroll a lot more down and so they just like eventually find something that they want to click on. Whereas maybe people B are really patient and so they just like search again if they can't see it in the top results. And so in order to understand what the, the difference is, it's not really enough to just see how often they saw this page and how often they clicked on something because that doesn't really tell you at all what they saw. And so what you really need to know is what they search for and then what did they see. And what they saw will often depend on the number of search results, the order they are displayed in, and how far they scroll. And so it's even if you can have from your back end the information of like, these are the search results that were displayed, 
that won't necessarily tell you actually tell you what people saw because you don't know how far they scrolled um, and you don't necessarily know what order they were shown in. Um, and so let's say we, we gather all of this data and then based on this we discover um, that users A searches actually display fewer search results. Um, users in the category B actually scrolled further down than users in A, so contrary to what we initially assumed, um, which means that like, their results must be really irrelevant because they're scrolling really far and they still can't find anything. And so maybe it's actually if there's fewer results it makes to seem people more likely uh, to click on something, that maybe we need to implement some pre-filled filters based on users' previous activity to have a better, like, so that the results that they do see are much more relevant and they're much more likely to click on it. And so when we do that, then suddenly we have much more people clicking directly through and much fewer people having to search again and again. And so, for example, maybe if you're a site like Airbnb, um, if you pre-fill some locations based on some initial values that you already know, maybe you know that um, pe people where people are based based on their IP address, then you can add in some predefined filters to help people find faster what they're looking for. And so really, to summarize uh, what we've kind of explored in these few examples, um, at Snowplow, we believe that owning your event level data allows you to understand better how your users interact with you, and therefore it really allows you to better optimize um, that experience for them. But it also allows you to target people more effectively because you have a good understanding of, of based on their behavior, what types of people might be interested and what content might they be interested in. And I think that's it. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> if, you, if you collect all of the events from users and you can collect like maybe 12 users during that time if you have, uh, how do you visualize that? I mean, as in, I now imagine a lot of work on my desk, right? I have no <laughs> idea. How can I not show, show that to, to, to any stakeholders or to, to anyone that pays for, for my uh, uh, analysis? So there's, there's a couple of different things. So you have, you, you have different purposes when you collect that data. Sometimes there's the purpose of actually like having some aggregated numbers that you want to maybe display in a table. But a lot of times when you have these kind of flows, which I try to do with my very rudimentary diagram of circles here, <laughs> which you can probably do in, in a lot of tools much better, there is tools that actually allow you to funnel things um, and really show like the, the, the volumes of users going based on different attributes that they have. And so um, the, the types of funnel analysis that you do there are much more interesting if you have lots of different attributes for each user and you can follow users along. Um, so in terms of visualization, um, if you think about like the very basic, um, a very basic graph like this, it only has, um, oh sorry, your desktop. <laughs> Um, it, it's really easy to visualize because you have all of the users lumped together. And so you have all of the views on one side, all the inquiries on the other side. If you start to split people out by different categories, obviously it becomes a lot harder to understand visually what's going on because you have like all these different slicing and dicing methods. And that's where like um, modern BI tools can be really, really useful. So you can have things like indicative where you can make really nice funnel analysis or you can have tools like Looker um, where you can really allow users to go in and based on specific filters, split all of this up into lots of lots of different types of um, users because again like when you have um, in the aggregations it's very easy to see what's going on but it might be very misleading um, the the more complex analysis can be uh, a bit more difficult to visualize but anything like more path related um, I guess kind of this but in a nice tool <laughs> it can be a lot more useful then Because uh, in your blog post, uh, in your blog, I uh, saw some blog posts about uh, that it's possible uh, with Google Tech Manager to integrate uh, those systems. Yes. So there's, there's um, so for Google Tag Manager, you can definitely use Snowplow, JavaScript Tracker, and Google Tag Manager. You just put it in a custom HTML tag. Um, that's absolutely fine, and a lot of our customers do that. 
um, if you want to like integrate it with Google Analytics, so you can't obviously send Snowplow data to Google, but you can send Google data to Snowplow. So we have a plugin that allows you to automatically ingest all of your GA data into Snowplow. Um, that's often a really nice starting point, but because of the types of data structures we support in Snowplow, we don't recommend using that out of the box integration because you can actually structure your data much nicer if you use like Snowplow native um, data structures rather than GA. But yeah, you can, there is a plugin that basically just lets you fire all of your GA uh, events directly into Snowplow and into your own data warehouse. Let us avoid uh, dub, uh, making double work uh, about uh, um, setting uh, tracking for both systems. So um, the the out of the box Snowplow implementation is pretty straightforward. Like you, we, we can give you JavaScript track and you just paste it and set it to fire on all pages, and that will capture all page views, it'll capture page pings that capture how fast people scroll and what they look at. Um, it will also capture things like link clicks, form fills, like all of the basic web analytics stuff. It's just one JavaScript snippet that you paste into one um, Google Tag Manager tag. So that can be really, really easy. Again, if you want to, um, if you want to uh, do more complex things and you don't, we want to have them in a nice structure, then you do have to to put a bit of effort into to do that. <laughs> Any other? Yes? So you mentioned that uh, one of your uh, big success factors was Amazon Redshift. Uh, but if you look at current developments in big data warehousing, um, uh, will you uh, keep on using Amazon Redshift or do you consider moving to like uh, an Amazon Red Queen altogether, which would be more similar than BigQuery? Um, so I think uh, what Rebecca was really hinting at was that that was like the first big move into like data warehouse as a service. Um, we now, Snowplow supports loading into Amazon Redshift, um, but also into Snowflake and we stream into real time in, into BigQuery. Um, so we definitely um, also have seen that there has been involvement in the, in the cloud data warehousing site. We also have some users using data directly off S3 using things like Athena or Redshift Spectrum. Um, we also have uh, customers using the data directly from the Kinesis stream um, or the PubStub, PubSub stream in uh, Google Cloud Platform um, using like um, other data flow jobs or uh, AWS lambdas um, to power real-time applications. So definitely we don't think uh, Redshift is the be all end all of um, cloud data warehouses. We just feel like it was one of that, that first shift into enabling small companies who can't afford to build uh, a massive own data warehouse, uh, giving them the ability to also warehouse their own data and use it in, in different ways. Yes. Yeah, I read on your blog that uh, you're also planning on um, offering uh, Snowplow for Azure. What's the latest on that? So, <laughs> um, yes. Um, so we already support loading Snowflake on Azure. Um, we are currently in the process of developing a solution that lets you um, split the Kinesis stream on AWS and send that to Event Hop on Azure. So that should be ready later this year. Um, so that the initial bits of the pipeline, the collector and the enrichment uh, process will be on Amazon, but then you can stream the data into Azure if you'd rather use uh, their data warehousing solutions. Um, I think having a full Azure pipeline is probably 2020 or <laughs> I don't want to make any any promises there that has been pushed back a little um, because we're, we're, we've been we've put focus onto Google Cloud Platform and, and we're still developing things there. Any other questions? Awesome. Rebecca and I will also be around if you have any other questions. We'll give you a couple minutes break if anyone wants another beer and then we'll have a fantastic talk by Stephen 
from BVA Auctions. <laughs> Thank you.